Hello everyone and welcome. Today we're gonna to be talking about chapter eight, which is all about gender. When we talk about gender, we're gonna talk about a couple of things that include this social construct. So let's first talk about the differences between sex, gender, and sexuality. Sex is the term for the perceived biological differences that distinguish males from females. Gender is a social construct that consists of a set of social arrangements that are built around sex. Sexuality refers to desire, sexual preference, sexual identity, and behavior. As you see here with the genderbred person, this is a depiction of the differences between your biological sex, your gender, as well as sexuality. So let's talk for a second about gender identity. Gender identity and gender expression are two things that fall under this social construct. As you'll notice with all of these things, they are not an all or nothing type of thinking. It's not one or the other. It's based on a continuum. You don't have to ascribe to the binary or the two boxes that we like to put people into because these things fall in a continuum. When we look at gender identity, this is how you and your head define your gender based on how much you align or don't align with your understanding of what it means to be part of either womanness or maleness. So on one end of the spectrum is woman, the other end of the spectrum is man, but you can have both, which is called two spirit. Or you may not want to conform at all, which is called gender queer or gender non-conforming, just to name a few. Then you have gender expression. These are the ways that you present your gender through your actions, dress, demeanor, and how those presentations are interpreted based on gender norms. And again, it falls on a continuum from feminine to masculine and all in between. Who you are sexually and or romantically and or emotionally attracted to, again, falls on a continuum from women, females, and femininity, all the way to men, males, and masculinity. When you think about your attraction, under your attraction, which is part of your sexuality, this does not mean that you have to have the same preferences for who you want to be sexually attracted to, who you want to be romantically attracted to, and who you want to be emotionally attracted to. They can fall in different spectrums or different uh, parts of the spectrum, depending on where you're at in your life. Those things are not always going to be the same. They can change. And finally, we have biological sex. These are your physical sex characteristics that you're born with and develop. And they include things like your body shape, your genitalia, your voice pitch, your body hair, hormones, and chromosomes, just to name a few. Again, they fall on a continuum from femaleness to maleness. So you can be a female to a male. You may have both, which is called intersex, or you may find that the body in which you were born with does not align with the body in, in which you envision, which is called trans. We'll talk about that in just a second. When we are studying gender, this involves looking very closely at the relationship between nature and nurture and not assuming that one overshadows the other or that there's a clear line that separates the two. It's common to think that there's only two sexes, male and female, and that all people fall into one group or the other. And indeed, this is a way of imposing order in a chaotic world. But there's evidence to suggest that we need to embrace a more expansive definition of sex, one that goes beyond two rigid and distinct categories, also known as binaries. For example, the ancient Greeks thought that there was one body, the male body, and that the female body was its inversion. This notion endured until the mid 18th century. Essentialist arguments and biological determination assign gender and explain gender differences purely in terms of natural or biological attributes. So what does it take to be masculine or feminine? Well, typically it's through socialization. That's how we form our gender identity. We can expand our understanding of gender differences by examining other cultures to see how they construct gender and by looking back in history to see how ideas about gender have changed. Something to think about is that not all cultures have the same binary gender configuration. For example, in Navajo tribes, there are not two but three genders. There's masculine men, feminine women, and the natal. And the natal is someone who encompasses both masculine and femininity in their being. 
And there are different types of presentation that we can think about. So there's a growing social awareness of transgender individuals. People who are transgender are those whose gender doesn't correspond with the sex in which they were assigned with at birth. There's also people who are cisgender, those whose genders correspond to their sex at birth. We also have androgynous. This is a gender presentation that's neither explicitly masculine nor explicitly feminine. When we look at gender differences, they vary over time. And this ideal about masculinity and femininity is historically contingent. Some theorists claim that there's what's called hegemonic masculinity that has arrived in society today. This is an ideal notion of a man that is so dominant, people are not even really aware of it. However, the notion of the ideal man has changed over time, once again, proving that gender is not a rigid, unchanging category, and it is socially constructed. When you look at historical perspectives of masculinity in the 1700s, that went hand in hand with kindness and intellect and, and writing and reciting poetry. That's not part of hegemonic masculinity today. When we think about these gender roles, these are essentially sets of behavioral norms assumed to accompany one status as a male or female. However, there's much evidence showing that gender roles have more to do with social status than they do with biology. Let's look at a couple of theories around gender inequality. The first is feminism. Feminism is a social movement to get people to understand that gender is an organizing principle in society and to address gender-based inequalities that intersect with other forms of social identity. Feminists propose that we live in what is called a patriarchy. And that's a system involving the subordination of femininity to masculinity. Something to think about is that at the start of the second wave of feminism back in the 1960s, theorists scrambled to find the answer to the woman question. So what explains the nearly universal dominance of men over women? And what's the root of patriarchy, a system involving the subordination of femininity to masculinity? Well, Anthropologist Gail Rubin proposed that there's this notion called the sex gender system, wherein the raw materials of biological sex are transformed through kinship relationships and relations into asymmetrical gender statuses. So in essence, Rubin argued that women are treated like valuable property whose trait pattern strengthens relations between families that are headed by men. And this sex gender system isn't natural, but a result of human interaction, socialization, and what society says is acceptable at the time. Theoretical approaches to studying gender based in structural functionalism, such as Talcott Parsons' sex role theory, assume that gender differences exist to fulfill necessary functions in society, but it does not allow for the possibility that other structures could fulfill the same function or the fact that structures change throughout history. When we are thinking about this, it's important for us to understand that history certainly plays a role in us understanding gender and that socialization and this development of the hegemonic masculinity is something that has, evolved, has developed and evolved over time. And it can be toxic, especially for those who are female, feminine, or a woman. Psychoanalytic theories about gender focus on individualistic explanations for gender differences as opposed to societal ones. Inherent in these theories is the notion that natural differences exist between men and women that dictate how they behave. Conflict theorists mixed old school Marxism with feminism to claim that gender, not class, was the driving force of history. Social feminists, also known as radical feminists, claim that the root of all social relations, including relations of production, stemmed from unequal gender relations. Interactionist theorists propose that gender is not a fixed identity or role that we take with us into our interactions. Rather, it's the product of those interactions. In this framework, gender is a matter of active doing, not simply a matter of natural being. Black feminists have pointed out 
that gender does not function in a vacuum and that gender studies must take into account the fact that no single category of women or men exist, but that categories of race, class, gender, ability, education, just to name a few, exhibit what's called intersectionality. And intersectionality is how they are essentially incorporated, that there is a complexity of overlapping ideals that include things like gender and race, but yet they are still distinctively different. They need to be looked at individually, but also looked at in an overlapping um, manner. When we look at intersectionality, these create what's called a matrix of domination, the intersecting domains of oppression that create a social space of domination and by extension, a unique position within that space based on someone's intersectional identity. Some postmodern theorists question the whole notion of woman as a separate stable category and the value and appropriateness of Western scholars applying their cultural logic to the study of non-Western societies. We also have this middle range theory. This may be most useful in addressing the complicated subject of gender because they connect people's day-to-day -day experiences to larger societal forces. So, what accounts for the wide range of statistical differences between men and women? Well, something that essentialists refer to is called natural sex differences. But sociologists call these same differences deceptive distinctions, those that arise because of the particular roles individuals come to occupy. This figure here looks at the increase of women in the workplace between 1970 and 2016. And something that you'll see is that men have declined in the workforce, but women have steadily inc have increased how they are engaging in the workforce. So this is something that we need to take into consideration because if we follow the rate at which men are leaving the workforce and women are entering in the workforce, there will soon be more women in the workforce than men. But yet women are treated as inferior to male counterparts, which are seen as superior. Something else to think about too, is that studies show that gender inequality or sexism is rampant in places like schools and work. When we look at schools, boys and girls are treated differently by teachers and different expectations exist for their behavior and performance. The textbooks and other materials used in schools often reinforce gender stereotypes. So as we just saw, women are a significant part of the workforce today, yet they still face many challenges in the working world, including unequal pay, sexual harassment, sexism, tracking to certain kinds of jobs, the feminization of jobs, and more. When women do obtain positions that are typically dominated by men, they face enormous pressures. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Part of what we look at when we're looking at these pressures that are faced in the workplace, as well as the different barriers and challenges they face in the working world, sexual harassment is one of them. When we look at the definition of sexual harassment, sexual harassment, first of all, it should be noted that sexual harassment in the workplace or in any place is considered illegal. Sexual harassment, the actual definition for it is behavior that's characterized by the making of unwelcome and inappropriate sexual remarks or physical advances in a workplace or other profession or social situation. It is protected by what is called the EEOC. This is the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Sexual harassment, while it's typically not overt or explicit, is typically going to be something that does occur. And many women and men, men can be on the receiving end of it too, but typically it happens more with women, or at least those are the numbers that we see statistically. And remember that statistics can be wrong, but when, or inaccurate, because a lot of people don't come forward. But when we look at how people who are impacted by sexual harassment, they often report not feeling safe or comfortable coming forward. So it's something that is a true barrier in the workplace and can prevent women or feminine, uh, feminine individuals from being able to try to advance in the workplace. 
Furthermore, women are typically earning only about 80% of what a man makes. So for every dollar a man makes, a woman for the same job is only making 80 cents. That's problematic. As I had just mentioned, when women obtain different positions that are typically dominated by men, they are facing enormous pressure. And this is called the glass ceiling. The glass ceiling is an invisible limit on a woman's climb up the occupational ladder. There's a sense that all women will be judged based on their performance and that they're often called in this catch 22 regarding their behavior. If they act like a man, they're seen as unfeminine and somehow unattractive. If they exhibit more feminine qualities, they're seen as not being tough enough. Men working in female dominated fields don't seem to face the same scrutiny and challenges. In fact, studies show that such men advance more quickly, which is what's called the glass escalator, than their female counterparts. There's also this notion of opting out. That refers to a perceived trend among mostly middle class women of leaving the workforce to be full time wives and mothers, in large part because of frustrations with the many obstacles they face on the job and the sense that they can find fulfillment at home. Much like gender differences, especially when we look at sociology in the bedroom, sexual practices vary across time and place which supports the notion that sexuality is as much a social construct as gender in, is. Marxist feminists see sexuality as an expression of the unequal distribution of power between men and women and argue that women don't really choose heterosexuality, but have it imposed on them by a male dominated society. The term homosexual, which refers to the social identity of a person who has sexual attraction to and or relations with people of the same sex, is a concept or identity that emerged in the mid 19th century. Bisexual refers to a person who is sexually attracted to members of both genders and sexes. Michael Foucault, he relates the emergence of, the, of homosexual identity to the development of states and scientific disciplines and a desire in both arenas to monitor and categorize people and behavior. Foucault also introduced the notion that self-surveillance is a form of social control. There's this growing recognition that if we look closely, we can see many forms of gender and sexual identity that don't conform to categories that have dominated these discussions. That's where heteronormativity comes in. This is the idea that heterosexuality is the default or normal sexual orientation from which other sexualities deviate and is not held as the same norm anymore. I hope that this was helpful for you. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, I hope you have a great day. Make sure that you leave a comment in the box below. I would love to know from you, how do we as a society place different sexes and genders in a position to be impacted by things like socioeconomic status, education attainment, and occupational opportunities. So make sure that you answer that in the question box below. Until next time, I'll see you soon. Remember to be kind and to work harder, excuse me, work smarter, not harder. Have a good one, y'all. Take care.